as we talk about inner wholeness and expect God to heal us on the inside. You know, when we suffer something on the outside, physically, you got a cold, a fever, a headache, it does affect what you can do. It does affect your interactions. You can't go out. You, you kind of sometimes don't want to talk to people. You want to be left alone. You want to rest. It does affect your normal activity and the things you can do. Similarly, if our inner person, our soul, which is our mind, our will, our emotions, if we are hurting in our soul, in that realm, even that affects our everyday life. And just as God is the healer of the body, He is also the healer of the soul, our mind, our will, our emotions. And that's the focus of this whole series as we explore what the Word of God has to say to us about the soul and how you and I can be made whole in the realm of our mind, will, and emotions. How can we receive healing from God in that realm? How can we receive restoration and what changes can God bring about in us in the realm of our soul? That's what we want to talk about. And many times because of limitations, wounds, and hurts in our soul, we are crippled. We are unable to reach our full potential, our destinies, accomplish the things God wants us to accomplish because of hurts and wounds and things that have marred our soul. So we're going to spend several Sundays talking about that. In Proverbs, the 27th chapter and the 19th verse, Proverbs 27 verse 19, the Bible says, As in water face reflects face, so a man's heart reveals the man. You look in the water and you see your, your reflection. So the Bible says similarly, your, a man's heart, a man's inner person reveals the man. You know, many times we can uh, cover up the outside, you know, the old print, perfume, makeup, all those kinds of things. Make yourself look pretty on the outside. But the Bible says your heart reveals you. Who you are on the inside, who's who you really are. Amen. A man's heart reveals the man. And so we have to deal with the inner man, with the person on the inside. Because outside we can put up all kinds of masks and all kinds of pretensions and not go past. People may not be able to see the real person on the inside. Now let's just talk about how our inner brokenness affects our everyday life. How does our inner brokenness affect our normal day-to-day -day activity, whether it's in the workplace, in school or college or things of that nature? You know, if for example, let's give, give different examples. If I, I'm a person who feels that, I, that nobody really likes me. I have a poor self-image, a poor self-worth. I tend to withdraw from people. And so automatically, I don't move too much with people. Why? Because I feel I'm not so loved, not so welcome with, among people. But it's not that I cannot speak. It's not that I don't have the ability to speak. I don't have any thoughts to share or experiences to share. It's because there's something inside me that, that makes me feel less valued that causes me to withdraw. Or take another example. If there's a, a young lady, that's not a young, a lady who, who always seems to get into trouble with all her male colleagues. She fights with all her male colleagues, gets into, gets into arguments with her boss who happens to be male with a security guard who also happens to be male. I see just any male person she ends up getting into trouble with. And so the HR in the, off, in the organization, you know, sends up for soft skills training, sends up for how to improve interpersonal skills, and all kinds of things. But the root cause is not that she doesn't know how to speak or behave, but perhaps while growing up, some male authority in her life mistreated her. It could have been a father. It could have been some other male authority in her life who mistreated her. And from that time, she said, all males are devils incarnate. I mean, she might not express it, but inside, deep inside, that's what she feels. That's what she believes. And so it shows up in the workplace as she interacts with all her colleagues, interacts with a male boss and all that. Oh, and it just shows up sooner or later. Something goes wrong. And the HR is trying to break his head. What can I do to fix the problem? The real reason is, deep inside, she believes a lie. Thank God it's only a lie. <laughs> or think about a person who, who has a deep sense of inadequacy. I mean, he's good in his work. He's highly skilled, highly talented. But inside him is a deep sense of inadequacy. So that 
whenever somebody wants to give him responsibility, he says, no, I don't want to take it up. I'm satisfied doing what I'm doing. But he doesn't want to step up and take leadership, take responsibility. Why? Not because he does not have the skills or the capabilities, but inside him he feels inadequate all the time. And he's afraid that if I step up and take that, what if I mess up? I'm most likely going to mess up. And if I mess up, I'm going to affect my whole team or affect my whole organization. And because of a deep sense of inadequacy, he refuses any role of leadership. And what happens? That stunts his entire professional career. Others go past them. He's good, he's skilled, he's talented, but he stays where he is. Simply because of inner brokenness, there's something inside. Or think about a young boy who while he was growing up, his father said, you will never amount to anything. You're, not gonna, you're good for nothing. You'll never amount to anything. And that was so ingrained into him. And now in his workplace, he shows it, expresses itself by extreme competitiveness. Why? Because in his mind, he says, I want to prove to my dad that I'm going to be something. And so it pushes him to extreme competitiveness. There's nothing wrong in being competitive and giving your best, etc. But this is extreme. In every moment, every time he's saying, how can I outdo the other person? How can I go up? How can I be smarter? How can I do this? How can I be better? How can I show I'm better? Why? Because deep inside there's a sense of rejection. He's longing for the approval of his father. And in the workplace, it's showing up as extreme competitiveness. Are you understanding me? So many times there are things deep inside of us that affects our everyday life, how we conduct ourselves, how we do things, and so on. Now, perhaps many of us may not have experienced much emotional trauma or abuse. You may not have gone through any traumatic experience. Your childhood must be, you know, uh, just next to perfect and everything is fine. But even us, even those of us who have had pretty decent upbringing and childhood and experience and so on, we still have to have our minds renewed because by default, the way we think is the way of the world. We think that way by default. And so we still need to have our minds renewed. Or there may be lies. They may not come into us through trauma, but there may be lies, deceptions, wrong thinking that we still hold on to which are crippling us and limiting us. And these need to be dislodged. These need to be moved out so that we could be set free and be all that God wants us to be. Or perhaps there are uh, thinking patterns that we are carrying. It could be religious patterns, it just ideas, or it could be other things that, that affect our behavior. Now here's the thing you and I must understand. That God wants us to be whole. He wants us whole, spirit, soul, and body. Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 23, he says, I pray that God will make you whole, spirit, soul, and body. And preserve you blameless to the coming of our Lord Jesus. I like how the message Bible puts it. It says, may God himself, the God who makes everything holy and whole, make you holy and whole. Put you together. Spirit, soul, which is the Greek word suke, which is mind, will, and emotions, the psychological part of us, and body. Keep you fit for the coming of our master, Jesus Christ. Doesn't mean you're going to be alive till he comes. As long as you're alive, you need to be fit, kept together, kept whole, spirit, soul, and body. And we also must remember, understand that, you know, other areas of our life, our prosperity, our general well-being in life is connected to the well-being of our soul. John wrote in 3 John chapter 1, verse 2, he said, Beloved, I wish above all things that you prosper, be in health, even as your soul so being in health, our physical health, and prospering in life, our well-being in life, is connected to our soul prospering. Soul meaning mind, will, and emotions. The well-being of the inner person affects your physical health and the general well-being, your prosperity in life. So in this series, we're going to talk about a couple of things. We're going to talk about this, this morning, we're going to talk about rebuilding your self-image. The next time we talk on this, we'll be talking about uprooting issues. We talk about healing deep wounds and hurts and reorienting inside out. Now, I just want to recommend some godly ministers in our city who are really good in this whole area of inner wholeness ministry. Uh, some of you know, may know Pastor Vasudevan. He's a good friend, longtime friend from the Methodist Church. He's, he's probably an expert in this area of inner healing and wholeness. I've got to talk to him. He, he's read a lot. 
uh, Pastor Russell David, we've recommended some people to go to him to get help in the area of inner homeless. Another good friend of ours is uh, Pastor Victor DeMont of Adonai Church. Who some of you have uh, gone to the encounter meetings. We encourage you to go for those meetings uh, where you can receive ministry specifically geared to dealing with things on the inside. Right? So we encourage you, if, if you really need ministry in this area, to meet with these men of God in our city who really specialize or deal well, very well in this area of ministry. Pastor Vasu and Pastor Victor, we encourage you to go receive through their ministries. And one thing I'd encourage you to do whenever you go to receive ministry from somebody else, take an offering with you. Amen? This is a free commercial. The point is, when you go to meet them, they're giving up your, their time to minister to you. Bless them as well with an offering because they're men of God. Amen? It's not that you're paying for their service. It's just that, look, they've given their life to serve the people of God. And as a way of saying thank you, do it. That's a free commercial. We'll go back to the message. All right. So receiving healing for inner wholeness. You know, as we go through this series, I want us to keep in mind that we're not getting into some psychology. This is not psychology, you know, 501. No, we're not trying to deal with issues through our human effort. What you and I as believers know is this. Our wholeness comes from God. And the Bible says, Psalm 23.3, He restores my soul. Amen? He restores my soul. It is God who restores us and makes us whole. So let's not try to depend on human efforts. It is God who works to bring restoration to the broken parts of our inner being. So we look to God. One of the two causes that damage the soul, what are the two things that really hurt us? One is sin and second is lies or deceptions or wrong things that we believe. Sin damages our inner person. When I sin, I'm not only offending God, I'm not only, I may not only be hurting somebody else here on earth, but I'm also hurting myself. First Peter 2.11 says, you know, Peter writes, he says, you know, as you, as sojourners and pilgrims, you're just passing through this earth. As sojourners and pilgrims, he says, abstain, stay away from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Fleshly lusts, what do they do? They fight against your soul, your inner person. They're warring against. They're an enemy to your soul, your mind, your will, your emotions. In the book of Proverbs, for example, Proverbs gives an example. Proverbs 6.32 says, Whoever commits adultery lacks understanding. Whoever does this destroys his own soul. So when you commit adultery, you're not only violating somebody else, but you're destroying your own soul. You're hurting your own inner being. So sin not only affects my relationship with God, not only wrongs somebody on earth or violates a law, but it also affects me. It hurts me on the inside. Damages my inner person. The second thing that hurts my inner person are lies that I believe. Wrong things that I believe. We call it deceptions or lies. And lies or deception is, is Satan's powerful weapon against God's people. That's why he's called a deceiver. He likes to get people to believe wrong things about themselves, about God, about others, etc., etc. That's why he's a deceiver. And those lies cripple us. They hinder us from being all that God wants us to be and fulfilling the call of God on our lives. So two things that really affect us in our man are wrongdoing, sin, and lies, wrong believing. But here is how God brings wholeness into our lives. I want us to understand how God brings wholeness into us. First, God brings wholeness to us through the cross of Jesus Christ. When Jesus died on the cross, He not only paid the penalty for my sin so that I could be just forgiven and justified before God, but on the cross, He also dealt with the effects that sin has on me so that I could be made whole. Isaiah 53 verse 5 from the Message Bible says this, it was our sins that did that to him, that ripped and tore and crushed him, our sins. He took the punishment and that made us whole. He took the punishment and that made us whole. On the cross, he paid for my sins, not only so I could be forgiven and say, okay, God, I know you've dealt with my sin, you've, you've forgiven me, but he took the punishment and now I have been made whole. Sin Hurt me. 
Sin injured me. Sin destroyed me. Sin broke my relationship with God. On the cross, Jesus dealt with my relationship with God. I am forgiven. But on the cross, He dealt with the punishment He bore also brought wholeness to my inner person. Amen? So healing comes to us through the cross of Jesus Christ. Inner wholeness. The brokenness that sin brought to our inner person, the cross of Jesus makes us whole. Second, God brings healing through His Word. His Word is truth. John 17 and verse 17. Jesus said, Thy Word is truth. His Word is truth and as His Word enters entrance and enters into my being, it dislodges the lies, I believe. And Jesus said, when you know the truth, the truth will set you free. Amen. It liberates you. Breaks down those limiting factors in your life. As the truth of God's word comes in to our being. That's why James 1.21 says, you know, lay aside all filthiness and naughtiness. And, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save or make whole your soul. Receive the word. The word has to be engrafted. Not just heard. You have to embrace that word as truth. When you receive the engrafted word, a word, the word that becomes part of you, it says it will save your soul. The word save is the same word that, that means make whole or heal. It will heal your soul. Amen? And third, God works in us, brings inner wholeness by His Holy Spirit because it is only the Holy Spirit who can reach down into the depths of our inner being and make us whole. No, it's not like me sitting with you and saying, tell me what happened. And then what happened. And then what happened before that. And before that, what happened. And before that, I try to dig deep, 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 deep. And we all end up lost. So it's not about me trying or some human person trying to get in to the depths of your inner being to make you whole. The Holy Spirit is the one who can reach down to the depths of our inner person and make us whole. Amen? So as we... Uh, begin this morning, I understand that it is the cross of Jesus Christ, it's the Word of God, it's the work of the Holy Spirit that's going to bring wholeness to our inner person, going to make us whole on the inside. This morning, we're going to talk about rebuilding our self-image. I'm going to spend a, a not too long, but just some time on it. Rebuilding our self-image. Our self-image, what do we mean by that? It is how we perceive ourselves, our value, our worth. Our acceptance by people, our place in the world, our acceptance by God, and our standing before the enemy. All of that constitute what we're talking about as self-image. The inner image that you have of yourself, that's your self-image. How do you see yourself? What's your value, your worth in this world, your place in the world? You're standing before God. You're standing before the devil. What's your self-image? Now, unfortunately for many of us believers... We tend to form our self-image based on external things. Now, what do people say about me? If they, sell, they say, I look good, I feel good. But if they say, you know, man, you look terrible, that's it. It's a bad day for me today. So we base our self-image on externals. What people say, people's opinions. Sometimes we base it on our education, how much money we have, what we've achieved in life, etc., etc. So for most of us, a formula is, Self-worth equals net worth. And when the net worth goes low, your self-worth goes down. I want to challenge us as believers. Our self-worth must be based solely and entirely on who we are in Christ. Amen? That's your true worth, your true value. Even if your net worth goes to zero, your self-worth has not changed. Even if you lose your job, you don't get your money, people speak bad about you, you still hold your head up high. The psalmist said, Thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory, and the lifter up of my head. God, because of you, I can hold my head up high. Even when my enemies surround me, they speak against me, they accuse me. doesn't matter, God. My self worth has not changed. You're the glory and the lifter up of my head. Amen. And that's why we try to reiterate over and over and over again, I am who God says I am. Amen? Because what people say about me can always change. Today they might say I'm good, tomorrow I'm great, and the day after I'm a disaster. It changes like the weather. But God's word about me is constant. It's the truth, in fact. So I am who God says I am. 
Who you are in Christ is who you really are. You need to embrace that, believe that, and consciously make an effort in every circumstance, in every situation to say, I am who God says I am. Who I am in Christ is who I really am. That's my true identity. That's my true inner image. Amen. Now what's great, as things change, the our externals will begin to conform what you have on the inside. Now the challenge is to believe that you are who God says you are, even when it may not be very evident on the outside. Take for example, when God says you are blessed. Say, God, I don't look blessed. Surely people don't think I am blessed. It doesn't appear I am blessed. But what does he say in his word? He says in his word, blessed, Ephesians 1, 3, blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. He has blessed you with everything. You are blessed. So inside you, you carry an image of being blessed. So how can I do that? Because you embraced his word. Don Gossett says this, I'm blessed with heaven's best. I'm blessed with heaven's best. So you carry that inner image. I am blessed. Now my outside may not appear that way. It may not become so evident. It may not be evident outside. But my inner image is not based on what the way things appear on the outside. My inner image is based on the truth of the word of God. Are you with me? So inside you still rejoice. You're still happy knowing that you are blessed of God. It's only a matter of time when the externals begin to conform themselves to what God has said concerning your life. So as believers, we must learn to base our identity on the Word of God. We see the true reflection of ourselves in the Word of God. In James chapter 1, verse 23, 24, the Bible says this. It says, if anyone hears the Word and is not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror, and then he goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. The point I want to bring our attention to is that when you look in the Word or hear the Word, it is as though you were looking into a mirror. You see your true self. I like that picture of the cat seated in front of the mirror and sees a big lion in the mirror. And that's how it is when you look in the Word of God. Amen? You think of yourself like a little pussy cat, but you look in the mirror of the Word and God's Word says, you are bold like a lion. Change your image of yourself. Stop thinking of yourself as a little pussycat. See your true image in the Word of God. That's who you really are. Allow the Word of God to create, to paint your true identity. Allow the Word of God to paint your true self-image. Begin to act like that. Think in line with that image that you have from the Word of God. Philemon chapter 1 verse 6 says that the sharing of your faith may become effective. By the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you in Christ. He says, you know, when you have fellowship, here's what I want you to do. Acknowledge every good thing that is in you in Jesus Christ. Acknowledge the good things that are in you. Recognize them as a fact. That what I have in Christ, that's, that's who, who I am in Christ is who I really am. The things that I have in Christ is what I really have in the Spirit. And begin to live out of that. Let your self-image be formed by the Word of God. Now, let's just run over a few things here. You know, for example, you you and I need to recognize as a fact that we are blessed. We are accepted by God in Christ. We are justified and righteous before God. We have authority over the enemy. We are seated in heavenly places in Christ. God hears and answers our prayers. He always causes us to triumph. Our sufficiency, our ability to rise above any situation comes from God. We are more than conquerors in every situation. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and love and self-control. We are like trees planted by rivers of water. We will bring forth our fruit in its season, and whatever we do will prosper. The blessings of God will overtake us in all things. We are empowered by the Holy Spirit to be a witness for Jesus Christ. And we can go on and on with this, of what the Word of God says we have in Christ. For example, let's say, you know, you're in your workplace, and they've done their you know, annual performance review. And unfortunately, you're down on the list. Like you're the last person. They say, you know, your performance has been really bad. Now, here's how you react to that situation. First, you accept the fact. You recognize that somehow, for whatever reason, given to you by your supervisors, your performance has not been acceptable. It's been below par. You accept it. It's okay. I'm ready to deal with it. But on the inside, you carry an image that says... 
God said, I will be like a tree planted by rivers of water. I will bring forth my fruit in its season and my leaf will not wither. Inside, you're still strong. You're still standing. Why? Because your inner image is not based on their review. Your inner image is based on the word of God. Now, you have to face up with the fact, and okay, so you know, I'm willing to work, I'm willing to, to make the change that I need to make so that my performance goes better, but my self image has not been affected by the circumstance. Are you with me? And you say, God, this is what, this is a picture that's been painted in my heart from the word. I'm going to hold on to that. Believe that I will be like this tree planted by rivers of water that brings forth my fruit in its season. That's your word, that's truth. I'm holding on to it. Or maybe you come to a place where you have nothing left. You know, your, your money's gone dry and uh, things are really bad financially. Now, you need to accept it, recognize the fact that there are things that need to be resolved uh, financially. But on the inside, you have an image that the Lord is my shepherd. I will not be in war. In fact, He prepares a table for me in the presence of my enemies. He anoints my head with oil and my cup runs over. But what most of us do is when we get to that financial situation, the picture we have is we see ourselves out on the streets, torn clothes, sitting in the street corner begging. If you're not careful, your circumstance can drive you to create and form an image into yourself saying, you know, that's what's going to happen to me. Oh, man, the next thing I'm going to do is end up on the streets. But instead of that, you recognize, yes, things are tough financially, but my inner image says, the Lord's my shepherd. I'll not be in want. Amen? So I'm not going to paint those fearful pictures of, of me being on the streets begging and this and that and disaster. No. My inner image has been formed by the Word of God. Amen? I just want to share with you, you know, simple thing that, you know, when I was young, early in my teenage years, as I began to hear, read the Word of God, you know, as little children, we're kind of scared of entering Afraid to enter into dark rooms, right? Because you think that, you know, there's somebody hiding under the bed, somebody hiding under the window. You have all these things running through your mind. And so I used to be so afraid. I used to always follow behind my mother. My mother goes in first and I follow behind. I'm so afraid to get into the rooms, dark rooms and stuff like that. But when I became a believer and I received Jesus Christ and began to read the word of God, I came, I came across the word which says, Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the... And the word which says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Now, I'm a little teenage boy, and here's what I did. I took these two scriptures and said, I'm going to fight against this fear that I have. All these fearful things that are going through my mind. Somebody hiding under the beds, somebody looking through the window, somebody walking in the room. No, I'm going to get rid of those lies that are occupying my mind. With the word. So I began to say, you know, even if somebody is under the bed, greater is he who is in me than he who is in this room. <laughs> even if somebody's standing out the window, God has not given me a spirit of fear. I am bold like a lion. Taking these simple scriptures, I dislodged these wrong thoughts, lies. They're not true. But to a little boy, it seemed like they're true. But taking the word of God, I dislodge these wrong, these wrong thoughts, wrong imagination, these lies that seem to cause fear in my mind. And so now I begin to act on that word. Say, I will go and turn the light on. I will go walk into the room and do what needs to be done. I'm not afraid. Overcame that fear. Very simple example. But today, we have to keep doing the same thing. Take the truth of the word of God and begin to dislodge the lies that have marred your self-image. What are the lies that are crippling you, that have caused you to have a poor image of yourself or a wrong image of yourself? I mean, think about how most Christians pray. When they pray, they say, oh God, we are so unworthy, God. We are terrible worms, oh God. Now, they don't mean it. Why? Because when they, other times, they don't act like terrible worms. They don't act like, oh, poor me, guys. But only when it comes to praying, they begin to pray like this, oh God. We are so unworthy, God. We are not even worthy to sing this song, oh God. We're not even worthy. Come on, they don't really believe all that, but they say all that. Why? Because they've got a wrong image of themselves inside. 
You need to get rid of it and instead paint the right image from the Word of God. What does the Word of God say? The Word of God says we have access with confidence in the presence of God. We are boldness to enter into the holiest of holies. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace. The Bible says He has been become to us the righteousness of God. We are complete in Christ. We are accepted in the beloved. We are justified and we have peace with God. That's what the Word says. But the reason people pray these pretense poor me prayers is because they've got a wrong image of who they are before God. You understand me? But when you have the right image painted by the truth of the word, then you're going to pray say, God, I'm so thankful I can come into your presence. There is no sense of condemnation, guilt, or shame. It's been dealt with the cross. And I'm in Christ Jesus. I'm complete in him. He is my righteousness. Amen. Now, I'm not saying that if you sin, you don't confess it. I'm saying... If you do something wrong, recognize it as a fact. But your image is based on the Word of God. And that has not changed. Amen? Similarly, if your performance in the workplace is not good, I'm not saying we should go into a state of denial. You go to your boss and say, Boss, you're not seeing me the way the Bible tells you to see me. Look at me as a tree planted by rivers of water. Your boss will probably give you the goodbye letter. So I'm not saying we should go into a state of denial and, and begin to talk like that. No. If your performance is not good, deal with it. But your inner image of yourself has not changed because the word has not changed. If you're in financial problems, you've got to solve it, of course. But inside you, you're still confident that your God will supply all your need. Amen? That's what I'm talking about. That your inner image is based on the word of God regardless of your outward circumstances. Now, this whole process of dislodging lies and wrong things that you believe with the truth of the word of God is called renewing of the mind. And the renewing of the mind brings transformation of our lives. Romans 12, 2 says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. As long as you still remain thinking the way you used to think, believing the lies, they will hinder transformation into Christ-likeness. But as we begin to dislodge these lies, they will liberate us, bring us into a place of true freedom and transform us to be like Jesus. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I want to share two quotes here from Ed Smith, uh, whom God has used in this area. Brother Augie had talked about him. I want to share a little bit from there and then we're going to pray. Here's what Ed Smith say, say, he writes in his book on uh, healing life's hurts. He says, mind renewal occurs as the truth of God replaces the falsehoods people believe. When truth is experientially realized, perfect peace follows. As truth is embraced, what was emotionally painful as a consequence of lie-based thinking becomes peaceful. Transformed by the Lord's light and freedom. Once the lies are removed from a painful memory, a true metamorphosis or life transformation should be evident in that memory. So essentially, when falsehoods or lies or deceptions or wrong thinking get displaced by the truth of the word, it brings about metamorphosis, a transformation in our lives. The renewing of the mind is an ongoing process. None of us are perfect. None of us have arrived with perfectly transformed, renewed minds and transformed lives. It's an ongoing thing. Every day you make a conscious choice to believe that you are who God says you are. You make a conscious effort to keep your image based on the word of God and not on the externals. That you, you and I experience. We're going to take some time to pray. And I, and I like these three steps or elements in the process of prayer for mind renewal that Ed Smith shares. I'm going to share that with you and then we're going to pray. He says this, to facilitate emotional renewal, we need to identify the three basic elements in the renewal process. First, the present emotional pain. Second, the original memory container. And third, the original lies implanted in the memory container. So what are we going to do this morning? We're going to focus in on having our self-image restored or aligned to the Word of God. That you and I create an image that's based on who we are in Christ. Regardless of what things, what may have been spoken into us in the past. If parents have spoken and said you'll never amount to anything. Regardless of what your externals tell you you're worth. You and I need to come to a place of building an inner image that's based on the Word of God. We're going to do these three things. First of all, identify what's the present emotional pain. What is it that you're struggling with in your self-image? What is it that you and I are struggling with? The areas that I know that I'm not right in, in the way I look at myself. 
areas that probably you know that need to be dealt with. It could be a feeling of poor self-worth or a sense of rejection. Nobody really cared for me anyway, so nobody really cares for me now. So you don't allow anybody to get close to you. Why? Because it's a sense of rejection. A sense of inability. I don't think I'll really be able to handle responsibility. Leave me alone to do my work. I'll be happy with that. But don't give me responsibility. Don't make me a leader. Don't make me a manager. I can't handle it. Or a sense of failure. You know, I really won't be a success in life. And deep inside, you're afraid that someday you're going to have a catastrophic failure in life and that'll be the end of it all. Or maybe it's a sense of insecurity. You know, if a woman has a deep sense of insecurity, the first man who looks at her a little real nice, he falls for him. Because she's looking for acceptance. Because there's a deep sense of saying, you know, if, I, if this person doesn't accept me, nobody else will. And since he's showing a little sign of acceptance, I fall for it. Our insecurity also makes you feel like somebody else wants to run your life. You're insecure and, and think like, hey, they, they're trying to control me. They're trying to run my life. They want to take over. It's, it's birthed out of a sense of insecurity or a feeling that nobody appreciates you. So you're looking for appreciation from every, every corner. All of these things are parts of our self-image that need to be dealt with, and there could be so many more. But this morning, I want you and I to be honest and say, God, these are things that, that I'm struggling with on the inside. You're the God who restores my soul. You're the God who heals me. Secondly, what led you to, into this? What were the memory things in your memory container? What events or experiences led you to this place where your self-image is marred? Maybe it's your own actions. Maybe mistakes you've made in the past which are still haunting you today. And the effects of that wrongdoing are still affecting you today. But the Bible says, the punishment he bore makes us whole. Healing can come this morning. Maybe it was what others did to you. Experiences you went through that have caused you to have a poor self-image. So identify that. And thirdly, what are the lies in that memory container? What are the wrong things you're believing because of that experience, because of what people spoke into your life, etc.? Replace it with the truth of God's word this morning. For each lie that you and I believe, we need to replace it with the truth of God's Word. Acknowledge what the Word of God says. Look at the cross and say, Lord, in, on the cross, you, paid the, you took the punishment that will bring wholeness to me in this area of my life. So I'm coming to you, Jesus, the one who makes me whole. Welcome the Holy Spirit to reach into your inner person and make you whole. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We'd love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at apcwo.org. Also, visit our website www.apcwo.org for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.